All right. People are coming in the door. Welcome everybody to yet another Dorks. I am super excited about today's Dorks because it's slightly different than what we've been doing uh, previously. This one has more of an emphasis on science and art, uh, which is gonna be totally fun. We have two amazing speakers for today. And for folks who haven't been to Dorks before, the deal is we have two people who each give short talks. And after each talk, there's a 15 minute question and answer session. So Scott and I will ask questions and the other speaker is also welcome to ask questions. And if you have a question you'd like to ask, then you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can submit your question and the question will just be visible to the panelists. And so it shouldn't be interrupting things. So you're welcome to submit your questions while the talks are happening. Uh, and when we are done answering a question, we'll sort of release the question out to the group. Um, and so I am one of your hosts. I'm Kelly Wienersmith, and the other co-host is my buddy Scott. How's it going, Scott? Hey, Kelly. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Let's talk. Uh, let's start by talking about the the drink that you are drinking today, because it is an yes. intriguing, an intriguing drink. Intriguing is a good word. That actually is is I think spot on. This is uh, called Death in the Afternoon. Uh, a cocktail that was uh, invented by Ernest Hemingway. And it's basically just a mixture of uh, champagne and absinthe. And I had never, I've never had absinthe before. This is my first time with absinthe, so. And? <sighs> it is different. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> so absinthe has like a, an anise, kind of a black licorice sort of flavor to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, a little bit of fennel. So it's, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and then, you know, it's got a lot of champagne, so it kind of goes down smooth. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Nice. And, and what about you? Are you drinking the mocktail? I am. And the, the instructions for making eggnog were long and complicated and I just did not rise to the challenge. So this is store-bought eggnog, uh, and it's, as good as any store not store bought eggnog I've I've had in the past. Uh, fun Hemingway fact. Uh, so I have insomnia and to fall asleep at night I audiobook, and of course that means I fall asleep during part of it. And so when I was reading, oh, what is it? The sun also rises. There's there's a part of the main character that was blown off in the war, and knowing that is really important for understanding the rest of the story. And I fell asleep through that part and didn't understand any of that and was complaining to my husband that like, <laughs> I just don't understand why the two characters don't like, and Zach was like, well, they couldn't. Anyway, point is you really should stay awake through all of that book if you want to appreciate it and, and don't like fall asleep through the important parts. Uh, but uh, Mary, speaking of Hemingway, do you want to tell us about what you're drinking? Sure. Um, I was too chicken to try the death in the afternoon. So I, I made a different Hemingway drink because I don't like licorice. So this is just uh, whiskey and soda. And I used uh, bourbon. Can't go yes, wrong with that. That sounds yeah. great. So did Hemingway come up with just like a bunch of drinks? And that's why we all that's, that's why there's more than one option. Uh, I read about it this afternoon, and evidently he was he mentions whiskey and soda in more novels than any other drink. <laughs> Probably <laughs> since it's so common. So he may not have invented it, but he certainly uh, did a good job of sampling them all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Autumn, I saw that you had a cup filled with something. Was there a cat on your mug? Yeah, that's the that's the PG side. I'm not going to show you the other side because we're trying okay. to keep it PG. <laughs> okay. But yes, there's a cat and there's coffee in there. <laughs> that's a cute that's a cute side of the mug. The cute side, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and so Scott, I was really intrigued by your drink because I feel like in the '90s when I was like, what wasn't absinthe poured in a Nine Inch Nails video or something? Like it was a very edgy alcohol when I was a kid, and I had all these ideas about like, does it make you hallucinate? But you were telling me that yeah. it's, it's more tame than that. I, I had the same kind of association. And so when I was researching uh, these drinks, I, I read a little bit about this. And, and so I guess um, absinthe was, was illegal in the U.S. 
until like 2007. So really recently. So yeah, like as you know, I was coming up and first learning about different kinds of alcohol and, and trying different things. Um, absinthe wasn't, uh, wasn't really one of the options. And so it kind of, you know, has this intrigue. And from what I read, it sounds like those, I, the, the idea that absinthe is somehow, you know, more dangerous or, or, you know, has effects that are different from other alcohol is basically just kind of a made up legend. Like it's basically the fact that people who were drinking a lot of absinthe back in the 19th century and the early 20th century, you know, maybe were being debaucherous and, and you know, causing problems, but basically because it was alcohol, right? So it wasn't anything about absinthe in particular that would have been different than, you know, whiskey or vodka or anything else, but, you know, it's alcohol. So like all alcohols, you, you know, got to drink it in moderation. Uh, so yeah. now it's legal and you can find it. And I had a few different options for bottles um, in the, the liquor store that, uh, that I went to here in Houston. And um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. It's not, um, not, not having any crazy effects on me yet, but we'll see uh, how it goes by the end of this. If your questions get really trippy, we'll have to uh, <laughs> reevaluate. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, uh, on that note, I think that we should get started. And so let me pull up Oh, I lost the document where I have my introductory information. Here we go. Okay, so we are going to start with Mary's talk today. So our first talk is called Ecology in Fiction, Getting Nerdy with Ecofiction. I love it. Uh, the talk is by Mary Woodbury and uh, her affiliation is, uh, she's an author and a publisher. And her fun fact is that she had uh, the opportunity to run on the trail top, sorry, the trail atop the cliffs of Moher, I'm sure I said that wrong, on the west coast of Ireland and visit a couple places from W.B. Yeats's, Yeats's poetry. We sailed around the Lake Isle of Innisfree, in, which is actually a very small island uh, in Loch Gill and also ran south of the lake in Slish Wood, which is Sleuth Wood by the Lake in Yeats's poem, The Stolen Child. That visit to Ireland inspired her next novel coming in 2022 called The Stolen Child. All right, Mary, how about you start by correcting all of the stuff I got wrong? <laughs> and uh, yeah. That was kind of a long introduction or a, a weird fact about me and I apologize that no, it's good. about that. Um, I, I have a picture here of the Lake Isle of Innisfree, which is a poem by uh, William Butler Yeats. And uh, we sailed around it and ran nearby. Uh, nearby that was the Slish Wood. So it was just kind of exciting to me to see those places. And we, we were trail running back then and picked places to run that he had talked about in his poetry so just a weird little aside that's awesome yep do you want me to start now or yeah take it away okay i will start if things work here we go so my talk will be on ecology and fiction getting nerdy with eco fiction uh more about me my name's mary woodbury i write uh the pin name, my fiction pin name is Clara Hume. I live in Halifax with my husband and two cats, and maybe we'll see a cat before this presentation runs out. I ran, I run dragonfly.eco, which is a study of eco fiction. So why I was inspired to do that to begin with just goes back throughout my whole life. I've always loved the outdoors. My parents took us running hiking, rafting. We were always going outside to forests, mountains, rivers, horseback riding in the desert, you name it. And I also read a lot as I was growing up. So naturally, I, when I grew up to be an adult, I was really interested in fiction that took me outside or brought the ecology and environmental issues into the story. Sometimes that's called rewilding a novel. And one of the things I enjoyed as an adult was Game of Thrones, like so many other people. Um, I realized not everyone loved the last or the ending in the TV series, but the books were awesome so far. 
hopefully we'll get more of them. My favorite character was Tyrion Lannister, who said, what unites people? Armies, gold, flags, stories. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. No enemy can defeat it. And I believe in that power of storytelling. And that's one of the reasons like I've run dragonfly.eco for going on eight years. And I just constantly reading good stories. So I want to answer what is ecofiction. It's much what it sounds like. It's ecologically oriented fiction. Uh, some people just call it ecological fiction. It is a genre, but it is also a mode of storytelling that can occur in other genres. So it just depends on who is trying to explain it or define it. It's kind of broad and diverse. So here's some definitions. And I want to say that I'm not a big fan of reading everything, but I will provide this uh, presentation slideshow up at dragonfly.eco after this meeting. So one of the big draws to me was that um, something that Patrick Murphy said was that uh, there's actually two literary phenomena that are related. One is nature-oriented literature, which means it's nature only. It doesn't really include any human other than the writer. And then there's environmental literature, which is generally human impacts on the environment. So if you combine both, both of those, um, it makes it so the story can be any of those. And it's just a broad definition. And it, to me, it's kind of the umbrella of many other types of fiction that talks about the outdoors and environmental issues and animals, sometimes with no humans. So the ecofiction characteristics and traits are that there is no one kind. Uh, a lot of people think that ecofiction or any fiction that has to do with especially environmental disasters are always uh, kind of gloomy and dark. And it's true that there is a glut of ecofiction that is that way, but it doesn't have to be. It is also can be weird or hopeful or joyful, um, scary. It just doesn't always have to be apocalyptically terrible or dystopian. It can take place at any time past, present, or future. As a matter of fact, a lot of people who are writing right now about climate change think of some scenario, and they fictionalize it, and they wake up the next morning and say, wait, this is happening now. It's not some future scenario. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it can be a genre on its own or a composite subgenre, which is how I kind of prefer to think about it. And um, it, it, it's evolving. When ecofiction first started, uh, climate change wasn't as well known about or wasn't really, um, I guess, understood exactly as we know it today by scientists. And then there are common topics in ecofiction, such as different storms, but also the human part, how, you know, how humanity is affected by things like climate change is another area of ecofiction. And a lot of that goes all the way back to before climate change started when uh, colonialism had European people going out to conquest areas and, you know, tame the savage, which was awful, and take resources, out, natural resources out of the area. And, you know, the fiction around that focuses a lot on the, what's going on in the post-colonial era and, um, and the ongoing things, because that kind of thing never stopped. I mean, if you think of like uh, people, you know, might, or they're getting palm oil, for instance, out of forests and it's ruining the wildlife there as well as has some child and slave labor, which is terrible. Um, and it can take place anywhere in the world, this fiction. So there's a lot of representation of cultural and environmental diversity. Uh, so it doesn't have to be preachy or gloomy. And I will, you know, you can read that whole thing on my website, but it's just, I want to just emphasize that, I guess, because a lot of people don't want to read <laughs> terrible, dark fiction after they have spent the day 
doom scrolling the news. So there's different genres that are similar or lateral to or even possibly subcategories of ecofiction. And I've written a few of these down. Um, I've heard of all these are the most popular one, but I want to mention because Autumn is here that there is actually something called fungi fiction, which I haven't read a lot of, but it's uh, kind of in the vein of weird fiction, which I love. <laughs> like, um, but some of these genres are always solely about ecological things, but it is common that they are. And some of these are culturally, regionally uh, subscribed, I guess, and then, you know, with indigenous voices and science fiction, fantasy, uh, solar punk is kind of a newer one that is more than, a, it's not just fiction, it's kind of a movement where cleaner energy is being used in art, fashion, technology, and stuff like that. But there's also a literature component to it, which is really interesting. So the history is that, um, I think that this kind of fiction has been around from the beginning when humans started telling stories a long, long time ago and before fiction was ever even written. And I should mention that while my site focuses on written fiction, uh, this fiction can occur in games, poetry, uh, comics, movies, whatever, you know, whatever there is, and then the other art as well. So it eventually um, became something that got its own term, ecofiction, in the early 1970s. Um, probably the first time it was ever mentioned was by John Statler in this anthology that he published with really popular science fiction authors and some of their stories went back to the 1930s and I don't know if this screen will show up this is my website. I don't know if you can see it but here's some of the authors that participated in that anthology and a lot of them like you know Frank Herbert we know who that is and all of the other guys. So anyways, I'll move that one away. Uh, Jim Dwyer actually did an academic study and published a big book in 2010. Unfortunately, he's passed away since then, but his field guide to ecofiction was published by the University of Nevada Press. <clears throat> and it's been a good, helpful guide to me because he studied hundreds of books from around the world and, and just did so much with that. And this field is also evolving. Why is this fiction so important? My throat is actually <laughs> hurting now, so I'm gonna take a drink. So fiction humanizes the world around us and it makes it so that uh, we can kind of get away from the drier facts that, you know, climate data and stuff like that, that don't have any often aren't humanized, they're just kind of facts and it sits there. Fiction can also foster more empathy for others and this is true of all kinds of fiction. Science fiction has always provided real futuristic warnings and can inspire new and cleaner technologies such as those showing up in solar punk right now. Symbolism is a tool used in fiction and it often takes us to some world that's not really ours. So, um, but it gives us a new perspective of that world and maybe we're more accepting of that story rather than feeling like we're being hit over the head with our own world preachers, you know, sermons and stuff like that. And fiction entertains, but it also informs so here's some historical ex examples going up to 2000, and you'll probably recognize these stories, or at least most of them. I want to say that some of the classics like uh, Dune by Frank Herbert and many of Octavia Butler's stories are actually still around in popular culture. Um, Dune was just came out, was redone as a movie, and Octavia Butler has written various stories that deal with climate change and she was writing these back in the 90s and 80s <clears throat> and she um a lot of her stories are being adapted to the screen now so i can't wait till you know those come out here's some more popular books and um 
I've talked with quite a few of these authors actually because I'm doing interviews every month or once or twice every month. And then here's my picks, which might be kind of hard to see. So you can just check this slideshow on my website lately, but I've written down a couple books that really shaped me as I was growing up, <coughs> where I think is a good place to start when you're getting into this fiction, some science fiction um, and fantasy classics. Weird fiction was just one of my favorite <laughs> and kind of things going around the world as well as what I'm reading right now. And then finally, I have some references. <coughs> I originally did a version of this presentation at EcoCity Vancouver back in the 2019. It was before COVID. And um, a lot of that had to do with uh, the healthy social and cultural aspects of reading ecofiction. So some of the references there are just about reading the citations. And then the others are just there for you to find more about this field. And then we, we moved out to Halifax right when the pandemic started. That was not planned, but I didn't get to bring a lot of books with me that I used to have. But my husband and I built this bookshelf, and here's one of the shelves that shows some of my books that I was able to bring. And I'm starting to collect all my other books. And the two books, The Bird Song and Back to the Garden, um, a cheeky way to, to promote my own novels that fall into this category. So anyways, um, that's all I have as far as the presentation, but I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, so uh, I don't see my camera yet. That might just be the weird view that we've got uh, go or going, but but I'm gonna, so this is Kelly and I'm asking, oh, there we go, now I can see oh, it. So, Cool. Uh, so that was awesome. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit. I'd love to hear more about the the books that you've written and like sort of what they're about. And then I also have a question. So like eco fiction requires like some level of science knowledge and like for, you know, creating a, a world that's believable. And so I, I wonder, is there like a general theoretical framework for like how much of the real world you can break as part of fiction. So, you know, like I know there are some nerds where if you aren't 100% adhering to like, you know, all of the different physics in a sci-fi story, they're gonna get really upset and they're just not gonna be able to get into the world. And I, I'm sure to some extent, it depends on how good the writer is and how consistent they are in whatever world they create. But anyway, is there like a philosophy for, you know, like when do you break the reader if you break too many of the ecology rules? I'll answer this question first. <laughs> um, so science fiction and fantasy are perfect ways to write ecofiction. Uh, fantasy is not realism at all. So you can break things and you can imagine things differently. Um, usually, however, I would say for science fiction and fantasy, um, even fantasy that has magic that doesn't goes against our scientific you know models <laughs> is fine because that's fiction and science fiction generally uh, the way i learned it in college i just took like a basic science fiction and fantasy class is that science fiction should have it should be based on credible rules that we know or credible laws i guess that we already know but science fiction is also based on imagination and another thing is that science fiction isn't all about outer space and crazy things. Science fiction is actually a modern literary form. A lot of people are writing um, fiction about climate change that is science fiction, even though it has more realism in it than, say, other science fiction that's more about what scientists wish for or predict. You know what I'm saying? So I think science fiction is just all over the place. Now, any literary fiction about climate change, personally, I don't like it when I've read a couple of novels um, that deny that climate change is real. And I think that's looked on pretty lowly by most authors and people in the field, but you don't necessarily have to be a scientist to write this. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> um, I think you just have to understand 
science, the basic principles of it. And like when I wrote my first novel, which was Back to the Garden, it had to do with climate change. And I was looking for uh, data models and what scientists were predicting just on real weird little aspects in the future. Like I was wondering about insects that might be moving northward into um, Canada or Idaho or something from the tropics. And it was one of the things that's a prediction. It may not happen, or I think it already is happening, but it may not happen as it did in my novel where the mosquitoes moved northward and dengue and other uh, diseases became more rampant. So um, I, does that answer your question kind of? About yes. the first, that part of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does, thank you. Okay, and then, so my novels, I, I wrote Back to the Garden, which was inspired by the Woodstock song that Joni Mitchell <laughs> sang. And um, it was about kind of farther into the future. So I would think of it as a speculative type of eco-fiction. And I was just imagining how people would adapt to that world if they lived, like there's a lot of death that occurs. Um, but I tried to make it positive by just looking at a small family and a group of friends who were just struggling to survive. And I kind of kept what I, like in our world, to me, the most important things are relationships that we have with each other and how we can help each other out when something bad happens. Like let's say there's a fire or a tornado or a hurricane community a lot of times comes together. So I focused on that aspect so it would be more positive than um, just something that kills everyone in its wake. And then I'm writing the sequel to that novel now. It will be out next year. It's The Stolen Child. <laughs> and um, it goes more into uh, some other aspects of the world that just like uh, some some crazy cults that in the future, I imagine this cult that was not exactly like QAnon, but it's just about as crazy. And um, so that's part of that, but there's still a lot of like the whole, everything that happens depends on the environment. So, and, and then Birdsong, a novella I just published late last year is a weird fiction story. It was an experiment on my part. It was, um, a young adult novel, but it also had aspects, aspects of Greek mythology and climate change. And I'm thinking about my next novel now, but that's about it. Awesome, that's really, really interesting. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, oh, oh no, I just said that sounds really, those sound really interesting. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. And, you know, as you were talking, I realized like I, I wasn't aware that this is considered a, a, a literary genre. But once you're describing it, I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. Like I, I you know, I'm, uh, of course, I'm familiar with some of the examples that you gave. And I started thinking of others, um, like the movie Avatar came to mind for me as you were describing kind of like fictional ecologies. And, you know, that one, the, the, the ecology was was really kind of an important part of the story, um, uh, it, as as kind of fanciful as as it was. So um, it's really neat to think about it as um, as 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 a genre, a, as a literary genre. So um, a question I had is, and and you may not uh, know the answer, but I'm I'm curious if you know in science fiction, there's a lot of examples of how. Uh, authors dreamed up technologies, right, that later became actual real technologies. And in some cases, they might have even influenced the people that were developing those technologies. I'm wondering if you know of any examples of um, uh, eco-fiction in which an author imagined an organism or a type of ecological interaction or an ecosystem or some, some aspect of something that was fictional at the time but that was later discovered to be real? Oh, good question. Um, about the science fiction, I read a book. I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was just about science fiction uh, predictions and stories that actually started coming true later. And um, But as far as ecological, uh, I did read, now I don't, 
I haven't read any predictions about ecology, ecological uh, species changing or something like that. But I remember reading a few years ago, Nathaniel Rich wrote this novel called Odds Against Tomorrow. And I briefly touched on the idea of this. Um, and he was uh, trying to imagine what climate change would be like in the future, you know? And so he imagined this hurricane that would really impact New York. And when I was talking about this earlier, I was thinking about him because he wrote, I think it was an article in the New York Times where he wrote that he woke up when the when the novel was in its final draft form and ready to go to the printer. And the hurricane, um, was it Sandy or one of those hit, like it hit and did exactly what he was, you know, vision envisioning in his novel. And I think that that's happening a lot. And that's like, to me, I always think, well, science fiction isn't so futuristic anymore when it, when we're writing about things like climate change, it's just actually happening now. And, you know, the worst things that we can um, imagine are already happening in some areas of the world, maybe not everywhere, but yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, what you were describing about insects moving, you know, north, uh, uh, certainly there's a lot of documented examples of that, including some, um, you know, vectors of disease. You, you mentioned mosquitoes bringing dengue and other diseases uh, to areas where they hadn't uh, previously existed. I know here where I live in Houston, we have uh, Chagas disease, which is um, carried by an insect called the kissing bug, the rejuviated bug, and it didn't used to be found here, and 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 it is now, and it's thought to be, you know, climate change that has uh, been, you know, causing those insects to be able to to live further north than they used to be able to. So, certainly that aspect uh, of what you were describing, um, unfortunately, does seem to be um, happening. That's really yeah. interesting. Uh, Barbara Kingsolver wrote a book called Flight Behavior, which is really interesting. And in her novel, I'm pretty sure this is probably already happening. I think it came out in the mid 2000s to late uh, 2000, around 2006, maybe. But she wrote about uh, monarch butterflies that normally winter in uh, Mexico. And they started moving northward and ended up in a fictional valley in Tennessee called Featherton. And like, yeah, it's exactly what you're talking about. And I think that's probably coming true as well. We're starting to get uh, a few questions here coming in on the Q&A. But before we get to those, I wanted to uh, see if Autumn, if you um, wanted to take an opportunity to, to ask Mary any questions. For sure. First of all, I need to know about the fungi fiction. Like, <laughs> I like posted on your Twitter or something. I started following. Okay. You, so, oh my God, that sounds awesome. <laughs> I will. I will do that. I would check out Jeff Vandermeer, but there's also some classic weird fiction that has fungi. And um, I'm fascinated by it. That's why I'm so looking forward to your talk. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Um, I was wondering sort of how, because I'm, a community scientist, a citizen scientist too, and don't have a science background. And I've noticed, you know, in our information age, we have so much information available to us. I feel like, you know, anybody could learn about anything really, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of misinformation. And so when you do your research, how are you finding, you know, the, the right resources or, you know, where do you start for credibility? Uh, I look at, places that are credible um, and mainstream credible like NASA um, and some media articles will sometimes lead to actual studies. And I try to follow media that I trust like Washington Post, The Guardian. Um, I know a lot of media, if I even question <laughs> that, and I don't do a lot of social media either. Like I don't do Facebook anymore. I have Twitter, but I don't just sit there and read what others say all day because I know that there's a lot of information going around and I'm really cautious about it now because it's just really undone. <laughs> like a lot of the strides that our society was making. I just, it, cause you're gonna write a book about like the, another cult like QAnon. It just seems mm -hmm. like that was such a like mind blowing 
thing. I know. <laughs> Everybody's scratching their head. It's like, wow. what is that? Um, and I just wanted to add to the, you know, the science fiction and real life scenario that's happening right now. I don't know if you guys know of Bob Hendricks. He is a um, fungi uh, eco designer out of Europe somewhere. Um, and he is making um, mycelium coffins right now, but he has envisioned actual like street lamps using bioluminescent mushrooms. Oh, nice. He has envisioned ho whole homes where you feed your home as Octavia Butler did. You remember the, mm -hmm. the one story where, you know, she is like the, the organism, you know, and, oh my God. So I, <laughs> yeah, I just like, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, it's Octavia Butler. So <laughs> Yeah, Sounds a lot her. like what Cellar Punk is doing these days. That's so um, cool. Yeah, awesome. it is very cool. And then I just had one more thing. Did are you doing sort of any like uh, writing workshops for kids or the the next generation, like trying to get them into you know thinking more um, ecologically and fiction and and doing anything like that? I'm not. Uh, my website is really geared to adults and sometimes young adults but i do have a new feature on my website called turning the tide and this is probably a couple years old where i do talk a lot about what's going on in the world of fiction uh for for children and i actually just started writing another adventure story adventures of finn wilder because i just became a grandma for the first time and I wanted to let this little boy, like his parents are totally into the outdoors. They're always hiking and stuff. And I just want to kind of educate him. Just fun stories though. I'm not trying to educate. I guess it does, but yeah, but I'm not an educator as far as workshops and stuff like that. Yeah, I just wondered. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. That's all I have. Awesome. Uh I, I expected Scott to jump in and talk about the fungi homes on Mars. Uh, did did you want to talk about that real quick, Scott? I'm going to wait for for Autumn's talking. Okay, I don't want to say okay. anything that maybe she might touch on, but That's something, something we have to talk about for sure. Yes, yes. Okay, we we can save that. So so we got uh, Nancy had her hand raised for a while and and she put a question in the Q and A box. So uh, Nancy asked. Uh, I was going to ask if Mary considers Carl Hyacin's stuff, and I might have mispronounced that, uh, to be ecofiction, and also if she knows about Ken Opal, and then she says, I think his name is, uh, and his young adult series where bats are the protagonists. I have, I feel bad. I haven't heard of either of those authors, but honestly, there are, I have a database of books, and it has the most popular books and there's like over 900 and there's no way I could read them all and I would suggest to her that if she wants to email me she can find my contact at dragonfly she can email me and suggest a book that should be there and I'll, I'll look it up there's a few notability requirements but if it's something I'm missing and this is always a work in progress I really appreciate people letting me know hey you're missing this and this is important <laughs> Excellent. I, and then uh, I think we should do Hannah's question and then we should uh, go to Autumn because after that we'll, after Autumn answers some questions, we'll open it up for questions for everyone again. But so uh, Hannah gave a great talk at our last dorks about uh, the tumor microenvironment. But so Hannah asks, I remember getting super stuck on the eco parts of Jules Verne adventure novels as a kid. How do you as a writer intertwine the eco part with the plot to balance the descriptive parts with the plot. Any tricks you use? Um, well, there's also, there's always this information diet. <laughs> so uh, personally, I, I like reading things that have a lot of uh, scientific information in them, but, but most people just kind of skip over that part. Um, so I would just, I think the most important thing is if you're going to write fiction, fiction is art. It needs to have a good story that will reach the reader's heart in some way. And in order to do that, you don't wanna to provide too much information. Um, like they say, show don't tell, but I'll, I'll just try to remember that for a story to truly have impact, 
it has to be something that the reader enjoys, that the reader will feel and walk away thinking, wow, uh, I really liked that story. And um, so just too much information, too many facts, uh, too much data is probably not a good idea. So I would say that there should be a balance. But sometimes, like in my first story, people are like, how did the world get that way? <laughs> and I, it's like The Road by uh, Cormac McCarthy. You don't have to say how it got that way for it to be a good story because it, it was a good story because of the relationship between this dad and his son, you know, so. That was such a good book. Oh. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary. You've, you've really opened my mind, I can say, and, and also added quite a few things to my, to my reading list now, in, including your books. I'm, I'm excited to check out and <laughs> can't wait for your, your new one coming out soon. So, um, and if you're able to, to stick around a little longer, as Kelly mentioned, we um, will um, we'll have Autumn speak next. So I'll introduce her in just a moment. Uh, we'll do a Q&A after her talk. And then if we have time, we'll try to Kind of you know bring it together and, and open questions up for uh, either or both of you. So um, let me go ahead and introduce Autumn. So Autumn Anglin is our next presenter, and Autumn is vice president of Willamette Valley Mushroom Society, the study group leader of the Willamette Valley Mushroom Society Funga, working with Fungal Diversity Survey and the Pezzazalis Project at the University of Florida. She's also owner of Autumn Steam Ceramics and Myco Radicate. And um, for her weird slash wonderful fact, uh, she has a, a number of things here. So in addition to publishing 16 books, and curating over 30 art shows, she's also discovered three new species of mushrooms. Very cool. So um, let's uh, turn things over to Autumn, who is going to be uh, telling us a bit about the art of fungi. All right, let me get this up here. Hmm. Wait one second. My Zoom is not letting me share this. There we go. Always got to be some technical difficulties. All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, joining me from wherever you are. I know we're on a lot of different time zones. Um, my name is Autumn Anglin, and I'm an artist, a graphic designer, and a community science focused on fungi. So, um, I live in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, uh, living uh, on Kalapuya First Nations territory, otherwise known as Salem, uh, in, our, in Oregon's capital. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of my passions and my journey um, of art and fungi and community and all of it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory so you know uh, sort of how I got here. So in November 2019, pre-pandemic, um, I was the chairperson of the <clears throat> annual mushroom show in Salem. Um, I led my team through one of our best public shows to date. Uh, over 600 people attended that show. Um, and it's just a one day show. So it was a lot of people, um, great day. Um, so being the chairperson though, I began noticing some areas that we could improve for the next year, uh, one of which was helping our lead mycologist, uh, Henry Young, identify all of these tables of mushrooms. So back then, I only knew how to forage for a handful of mushrooms and didn't really know anything else. Um, I decided that um, there at that show that I would ask a few people if they'd like to start like a mushroom study group 
to learn how to ID mushrooms in the field. So the goal was the following year to help um, Henry and the other experienced people ID mushrooms, all those tables of mushrooms. So long story short, um, I started a, a fungi study group. This group included uh, Henry, Jordan Dodge, uh, Diana Reek, Jeannie Taylor, and a few others um, that we now call the WVMS Funga Study Group. Um, and we've been studying fungi now throughout the entire pandemic, which was the best thing that we could have done. So there's a few things that made all of this work. The pandemic really gave us um, all the time we needed to dedicate to this. We had an amazing mentor in Henry. Um, our group was small and motivated and dedicated and we harnessed every opportunity that we could. Uh, looking back, this group is what helped me get through all the lockdowns and the total life disruption without me barely noticing. Okay, um, studying fungi has led me uh, personally down a path uh, that I never thought I would go. So up until 2019, I just considered myself an artist with goals of being shown in so many art shows a year and trying to find my next solo art show. Um, today though, my goals now include things like help name the mushrooms I discovered, um, write a field guide for the Willamette Valley and the Pacific Northwest, um, be published in a scientific paper which I was last week, <laughs> which is great. Um, I want to, another one of my goals is to finish uh, setting up my uh, DNA lab uh, to sequence fungi. Um, and I want to send my collection of vouchered and preserved fungi to a fungarium um, and teach folks about fungi. So moving into the future, I want my legacy to involve fungi somehow. And, um, and I would like to be the one to help sort of contribute to the groundwork that future generations can build on. So fungi is an interesting field to study. Uh, it wasn't until the 1960s that fungi was even its own kingdom. So fungi used to be in the plant family, and then it was finally lumped into its own group because of uh, technology. So as we get better and better technology, we start separating out our kingdoms and, and things more and more. Um, so because of this, uh, relatively recent taxonomic shift and the increased access to technology, kingdom fungi, or like I'd like to say is queendom fungi, is being all kinds of worked out. So most North American species of fungi are named after their European macro lookalikes. Um, so as DNA sequencing becomes more affordable, um, more fungi is shifting places on those phylogenetic trees and getting renamed. And even some of the mushrooms I learned the names of a year ago have changed. So I bring this up because a lot of uh, the studying that we do in our group is learning uh, the old names so we can key out the mushroom. And then we have, oh, have to go look up the current names and learn those. So we're in this weird like transition time right now where we have to learn both the old and new names to keep up. So on this page here, we have um, iNaturalist with the current name. Um, and then I have a book that was just published in 2014 that is already, you know, has the wrong name. And you can see like in pencil, I have the right names written over everything <laughs> in all my books. <laughs> So um, fungi is a, uh, also a, a very elusive thing to study. It's extremely seasonal. Um, the habitat matters. 
Uh, and the climate crisis is taking a huge toll on our ecosystems, um, including fungi. Um, because of all of this, uh, it is one of the easiest fields um, to discover something new and really contribute to the foundation of an entire scientific field. Um, it's also being led by uh, community scientists who are, like me, passionate about fungi. Uh, this grassroots effort is a bit different than the top-down elite academic model that pushes um, other areas of scientific study. So like learning anything new, um, you have to know how to speak the language, which in this case is a lot of Latin. <laughs> Uh, you have to learn to use new tools like microscope, reagents, extracting DNA, learn how to observe. So the observation is where my background in art has really helped me pick this whole um, new study up so fast. So when I started going out into the field, I would sit and observe a mushroom. I would take photos of it. I would sketch it. And then I would fill out a field voucher. Um, and this process has gotten a lot quicker since I began to see repeat mushrooms uh, seasonally. Um, but every time I come across a new mushroom, I have to go through that whole process again. So moving from field ID to sequencing fungi is a pretty big jump. But it was thanks to the North American Mycological Association, or NAMA, um, for starting their Fungal Diversity Survey, or Fundus, um, who first got me into that. So this fabulous group of people, they put together this um, community science project on iNaturalist. Um, and our study group, uh, WVMS Funga, belongs to this, um, along with a lot of other groups, like 1,000 or so. So they offered to run <clears throat> DNA sequences on um, vouchered specimens at the beginning of 2020 with the goal of documenting biodiversity in North America. So in December of 2020, I paid for and mailed in seven specimens to get sequenced. So while I was waiting for those results, I began learning about how to do my own sequences and began building lists and tools uh, that I would need to make my own lab uh, in my studio. So then in March, I got my sequences back um, from Fundus and that started an avalanche of opportunity for us. So my collections caught the eye of Roseanne Healy, um, who works with Dr. Matthew Smith at the University of Florida. Um, they were just granted funds from the National Science Foundation to map out the Pizizales family of mushrooms. So since ascomycetes, which is a phylum of fungi, um, are like my favorite to focus on in the field, um, I had dozens of specimens uh, preserved already. So they offered to sequence my entire collection um, if I would just mail them there. Um, so I'd never done anything like that before. So before I sent them, I decided to share my passion for fungi and what I was doing and sort of that I wanted to work with professionals on this. And this was going to be something that I would be involved in my future. So they agreed to give me credit on any scientific papers that they produce using my collections. And they also asked me to continue to sending them species um, and through the next couple of years. Uh, so, so far I've sent over 40 um, specimens to them. Um, in addition to that, the folks at Fundus, the people who did my seven original um, sequences were really excited about my work that they offered us, our, our WVMS group, a uh, the highest grant that they offer. So our group got to send in 50 um, specimens to be sequenced by them. 
Um, so I just mailed those off, uh, this little box right here and all that's those spreadsheets. I just mailed that off um, in November. And I expect to see results from those 50 uh, in the spring, I think, probably March. Okay, so now that you kind of know uh, my process and background, I just want to um, show you some of the art that I have created inspired by fungi. Um, so I work in a couple different mediums, but primarily photography, um, ceramics, illustration, and painting right now. It's not everything I've done, <laughs> but right now that's what I'm focusing on. So when I'm out in the field photographing fungi or nature, um, I'm almost I'm really focused on the scientific observation and trying to capture the best image for identification. But when I take fine art photographs, my art brain clicks in and I'm strictly looking at composition and color theory, um, texture and light. So I shoot everything uh exactly as i want it in my camera um because i spent the first eight years uh as a professional photographer uh using film and developing it and um so now i shoot uh my canon uh digital dslr cameras uh and I switch, you know, I, I carry all that equipment out with me every time I go uh, into the woods or out in nature. So these are just some of the um, fine art photographs that I've taken of fungi. So another place um, where fungi inspires my artwork is in my ceramics. Um, I own a small business called Autumn Steam Ceramics, uh, where I sell one of a kind sculptural pieces. And I, so I make cups and mugs. This is a mug with a removable um, mushroom cap. Uh, and all of these were made this year. I, I'm a pretty prolific artist, so I had a hard time choosing. <laughs> I also make mushroom bowls. Uh, and mushroom platters. I've even made mushroom chess sets out of porcelain and spot plates. And I use these all the time for sectioning and microscope work. I even make jewelry. And my favorite and my best seller is the bookmarks. So these are ceramic bookmarks I make. So this summer, um, my son and I started making paper out of polypore mushrooms. Uh, this uh, particular paper was made out of um, Trimedes versicolor, or um, you, some of you might know it as turkey tail. So after I blended up the paper, the pulp, and you know, deckled out little pieces of this, um, I dried it and then sized it and then dried it again. Um, and now I'm making uh, little paintings out of them. So that's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, so this is just a fraction of what I do, um, but I hope that this inspires you to take some time to look at fungi with your families and while you're out in nature or even you know for this group professionally. Um, Thank you so much for listening to me. All right, thank you. Wow, um, that was amazing. I um, First of all, congratulations on your first scientific publication. That is super exciting. I'm so excited. <laughs> that is, that, that's, that's, that's really cool. I, I have, um, Lots of questions, but let me uh, try to organize my thoughts. So I guess, um, first of all, I want to say, you know, I, I, I love your work. And, um, and, and one thing I want to make sure I ask is if people are interested in purchasing any of your work, 
hey, it's the holiday season. You know, everybody's looking for gifts right now. How can, uh, how would somebody go about doing that? They go to your website. What's the best way to, um, to get so, in touch and, and purchase a piece of your work? Yeah, I've got several websites. Um, I've got microeradicate.com and autumnsteam.com. Both of them will let, lead you to my Etsy shop, which is where I sell my ceramics on. Um, so, uh, and I would really appreciate it because every time I make a sale, I buy more lab equipment. <laughs> That's what I do with my money. <laughs> help Autumn, help art and help science. That sounds like a, a, a triple win to me. Um, uh, and we can try to share those those websites on our um, on our, our Twitter account as well. Um, so yes, thank you for, for sharing that information. I will definitely be, be checking that out myself. Um, I, one thing I wanted to ask you is, I thought it was really interesting when you were describing the way that having an artistic eye really allowed you to make detailed scientific observations, right? Like having that, that, that keen eye uh, for, for sketching in the field and, and sitting and, and, and being with a mushroom and observing it was helpful from a scientific perspective. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how learning the science may have helped in, uh, inform or inspire your art. Well, um, it's interesting because um, fungi, the, the, the division of fungi, you know, right from the kingdom down, immediately is, goes into ascomycetes or basidiomycetes, right? And that distinction is only microscopic. You cannot tell that just by looking at a mushroom, right? And so right there, like right at, at the beginning of my learning, when I was just trying to divide what I was seeing into these two divisions, uh, I was like, oh, okay, so we got to like already know a lot of science to get into this, right? Um, <clears throat> and the, the, the way you tell that is uh, under the microscope, you will see uh, ascomycetes, they are, um, the spores are uh, developed inside this like tube, this ascus, uh, and basidiomycetes are developed outside on like little branches and there would be two or four uh, spores per basidia um so that that you know right there was like really interesting because then i was able when i was out in the field taking photographs or <clears throat> sketching i i could then go oh okay now i know what this is right um and i wanted to just you know any of you that are professors like i would highly encourage your students to take an art class especially a drawing class because it does help it helps seep that into your brain just a little bit more if you're if you have contact with the paper and you're sketching that out you won't forget it i mean this um this whole you know sketchbook that i have here that went in the field with me I can name everything in there now because I sat and drew it and spent time with it. Right. So, yeah. No, that's so true. And I know actually a number of scientists who also are artists and, okay. and that's what I hear from them as well is that it is, they go hand in hand, like one helps the other. And certainly it's true that they're um, that the art that they do does uh, help them with the science that they do in, in so far as it really, um, you know, forces them to, to, to see things in a way that they would likely not otherwise see. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm feeling very inadequate in my own skills as an artist. I, <laughs> I used well, to sketch when I was young. And... <laughs> I yeah, do like I photography, would... but I don't have anything like your, your uh, photography skills. I would say, you know, that fungi especially has now become sort of this lens that I see the world through, right? So um, I, I can find the connections and look at the ecology and our world. I mean, from politics, um, you know, down to what plantations are in our forests now and, and what the wildfires, I don't know if you guys noticed the slides, you know, that's just what happened in 2021 here in Salem. Like I lived through that, like that was the most extreme temperature year. <laughs> It's been wild, you know, and it's affecting fungi uh, where, you know, our group tried to get into the Willamette National Forest um, 
uh, to look at the succession after the wildfire, but they still have the forest closed. Uh, we can't get in there to see anything. Um, mm. They said, you know, I heard a story the other day uh, that some old growth um, root balls are still burning. Uh, that's a year later. <laughs> it's wild. Oh, wow. Yeah, wild and depressing. Yeah, it yeah. was not fun to live through. <laughs> no, no. Uh, real quick, uh, taking a step back. So, so Mary, I think we we didn't ask where your books can be gotten because I think immediately I think, oh, I know what books or online stores to look for. But is is there a particular good place to go to purchase your books? Um, you can actually go to dragonflypub.ca. Uh, that is my own publishing company. Um, it's kind of an imprint from my old publishing company where I published other people, but that will, you can find the books there and find where they're sold. Awesome. Thanks. So Autumn, I am like, I would have loved to have been part of your fungi group during the pandemic. Like, I wish I lived closer to you. Your group sounds awesome. So we, uh, we recently moved out to sort of the middle of nowhere. And after rains, we go outside and we see all of these fungi. And to be honest, I feel sort of like overwhelmed about where to start to try to identify them. And so, you know, you said that even for the first division, it requires, you know, having some microscopy skills. How long, like if somebody said, I want to be able to identify you know, something like 50% of the fungus on my property, how, how much of a time investment do you think it would be for that person to be able to do that? I, uh, probably a year. Yeah. Unless okay. they go join a mycological association in their area, they could get all their fungi identified from them. Like us fungi people, we're, we love it. <laughs> hey, you just send us pictures of mushrooms and emails. We're like all over it. We love it. We love to help you ID it. Cool. Um, I would suggest getting a field guide for your area and start looking it up. Um, you know, and do not worry about trying to understand fungi down to species. Instead, maybe just try to get it to the family or the genus. Right. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at a at a cup fungi, this black thing that Donadina nigrella that I had showed, you know, mm -hmm. you, that's an ascomycete. But, uh, you know, not, not a lot looks like that. Um, I mean, OK, I'm going to say probably. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then next, you need to really look at the habitat. So if you're, you know, looking in a field guide, be really specific on those um on the habitat and <clears throat> i think the hardest thing that i learned was actually how to key out a mushroom um i don't know if you guys know you know about keys but okay yeah there it's it's really really difficult because you have to uh, <laughs> So it's very subjective because of the colors, right? They're like, it's ochre. And you're like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it is, you know, your division in those keys is the difference between a, a, an off-white and a creamy white spore print. But that could be like, um, well, you know, how much of a spore print did you get? Can you even see that, you know? And so, uh, it also could be, you know, that you don't have enough rain and your mushrooms are looking weird and funky and small. And so, you know, they like the, all the books and all the keys, they give you like these parameters, but like I've found mushrooms way outside of those parameters. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, nature doesn't cooperate. No, <laughs> no, no, she doesn't care. And then I think Ada had a quick question. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, what would you name a fungi if you got the chance to? Well, I would have to go with the um, taxonomic, like what they what they let you name mushrooms. So right now they won't let you name mushrooms after names anymore. You have to name them uh, within the certain Latin or Greek um, thing. So. This one mushroom that I found, 
was super slimy and we could barely hold on to it. But I found it with my son who is 10 or was 10 at the time. And so I would love to name it after him, but uh, because they won't let us use names. I don't know. I'd have to just uh, defer to, you know, like the slimy teeth mushroom, whatever that is in like Latin. <laughs> That's cool too. But yeah. yeah, bummer that you can't name it after, after someone anymore. No. <laughs> it's weird that there's different naming rules for different groups of organisms, right? Like the botanists have their rules. The zoologists have their rules. And I didn't realize that the the um, the mycologists, the fungal experts, have uh, their own rules. I, I mean, it makes sense taxonomically, as you mentioned. They are another group of of uh, living things, but um, it is just a bizarre quirk of science that the rules are different for different groups of organisms. It is. It's interesting. I I would really like to um, name one, but from what I gather, there has to be. Um, five to eight specimens found um, in order to name a mushroom. Um, and so since I have found one of one, <laughs> we're waiting on other people to find more, I think because they want to see the span of the area that that mushroom would grow in, right? But, you know, the this one mushroom I found, uh, this little black cup fungi growing on a, a Douglas fir cone, um, has the only other the closest uh thing they found in the in gen bank was a soil sample from british columbia you know and that was like a 80 percent match so it isn't really even that so i don't know when this will happen we we just need a lot more people observing a lot more fungi <laughs> one of my favorite facts about fungi of which there are a lot, but one of my favorites is that uh, some people claim that the largest living thing in the world is a, uh, a fungus, an individual fungus that lives in Oregon. And I'm wondering if if you've seen it or if you have in, you know, any firsthand uh, interaction experience with the world's maybe largest living thing. I um, I do know about it. We are uh, uh, Willamette Valley Mushroom Society has talked about it. It's been in the news, you know, it's uh, called the humongous fungus. It's a species of um, honey mushroom, which is a pathogen. So uh, it's not, uh, you know, it. I don't know that much about it. I have seen honey mushrooms and um, arm, uh, armillarias, but uh, I think that's, further up in the mountains that I don't really live nearby. So I, I'm surrounded by two different mountain ranges, um, the coastal range right on the Pacific coast and then the Cascades. Uh, and so I'm in a valley and um, uh, so I, I don't actually live up in the mountains. I have to travel there. Fair uh, enough. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. So um, Mary, I see we have some M Wood questions from an M Woodbury, but that's not you, right? Was was there? A uh, it might be my husband. I don't know. <laughs> His name starts with an M. Would you like to ask a question, or should I move to uh, Morgan's question? Oh, I have a question for Autumn. If that's why you're asking, uh, I, first of all, I'm just blown away by the fact you're so good at science and art. It's an envious place I would love to be. I was wondering if you ever did or saw some really cool um, time-lapse photography from mushrooms doing their thing. <laughs> yeah, so I do that. I, I set up stuff. Um, it There might be some on my Mike Eradicate website. Um, but if you guys ever have a chance, please watch Fantastic Fungi. Uh, it's a movie that came out a few years ago. I it just watched it. <laughs> so good. Yes, it's so good. And it's full of um, time lapse by like the time lapse king. Like he's so good at that stuff. So yeah, I, um, I set up uh, mushroom blocks to 
grow mushrooms to eat and I'll do uh, time lapses of them. I did one on the um, oyster mushroom block that I had and it's so much fun to do. Oyster mushrooms grow really fast, like within two to three days once they start pinning. So it's a real easy, like, you know, you just set up your camera and do it. Lion's mane on the other hand, you know, they take forever to grow. It'd be like weeks of, you know, setting your camera. And I, I use my camera, so I'm like, well, <laughs> Um, I get outside in, you know, when it's pouring, when it's snowing, like I'm outside all the time. So I, I, you know, I need my camera out there. <laughs> awesome. All right. We have another question from Hannah. She says, uh, oh my God, citizen science is amazing. Any suggestions for a kid's science fair project? What kinds of questions are out there? Yeah, so I think like a great science fair project would be to grow some mushrooms from mycelium. So you can start a um, oyster mushroom on a piece of cardboard. It'd be super easy for kids to do. Um, you just wet some cardboard, get some spawn. You can get them like just Google um, uh, oyster mushroom spawn and you can find it and it's pretty cheap, you know, 10 bucks. Um, it would be, uh, you know, um, another really good thing to do would be sort of the, the life cycle of the mushroom that the mushroom, you know, is the end dying, you know, body sending out its spores, the actual, you know, living organism is the mycelium underground. If they could watch fantastic fungi, if they have the attention span for that, they could learn, you know, about mycelium and how prolific it is it's under our feet you know it's miles and miles and miles of it um and another really cool thing that i did this summer was um i did a night walk in the forest with the uv flashlights and so that would be a really fun thing for kids my kids really enjoyed it anyways we all got our uv flashlights and different spectrums and we found all the glowing things in the forest including you know bugs and and stuff but the fungi was prolific and it and some of it glowed really really cool uh that so that that would be fun just like you know you could pair different light wavelengths with uh fungi and how they react uh which would be a fun project um another fun project was what like what you could do with mushrooms so you can eat them um, you can make medicine with them. Uh, you can, like I did, make paper, which is really fun and easy. Uh, you can probably find a polypore on a tree somewhere and blend it up and it, you know, it turn it into paper. Um, you could, uh, there are mushrooms you can dye with. So you could uh, do eco dyeing. Um, get uh, certain types of mushrooms. I mean, that would take a little bit more ID work to know which ones do, but you could just get a mushroom and see if it dies something. Maybe you'll discover a new dying mushroom. You know, you never know. That'd be fun. Uh, and you could also, you know, do something like show how fungi is sort of in everything from breads and beer to, uh, you know, there's fungi that live in lichens and, uh, in the ground we walk on in, uh, you know, so many different things. So yeah, I have started a um, part on my Myco Radicate website. It's not fully fleshed out because, you know, I've only been doing this for two years. I, I need some time, but um, called um, um, the matriarchal um, mom, uh, I don't know, something like that. Anyways, it's for kids. Uh, so check it out, you know, on there if you want more ideas. So um, along those lines of thinking about like science fair projects for kids. So Morgan Woodbury is asking, uh, what are good apps or other sort of uh, resources for uh, learning to identify fungi? You mentioned, you know, field guides earlier. Um, Morgan is pointing out that there's, you know, apps like iNaturalist are good generally for um, identifying organisms. Do you use iNaturalist for fungi or is there a, a, a better digital resource? I do use iNaturalist and it's been wonderful because 
obviously I'm prolific uh, at taking pictures and it's great because that website will store all that information and keep it all organized for me. So I love iNaturalist. I have it on my phone and when I go out, I'll take a picture. So it'll record the GPS coordinates for me while I'm out. Um, and then when I get home, I'll upload my other, you know, photos I took with my camera um, and other things in with that observation. So I use iNaturalist every week. Um, there is another website called Myco Observer, but I don't use that one as much. I find iNaturalist, the, the people on iNaturalist seem to be a little bit nicer. Um, so I don't know if you guys ever come across this, but a lot of times when you're starting out, you get things wrong a lot. And then you'll have people go, that's wrong. Oh my God. How could, how dare you, you know, they, you know, and then, so I naturalist is a lot kinder <laughs> for beginners and at, people aren't as, you know, uptight and snarky and, um, they're, they more like help guide you instead of being, you know, really upset with you for getting something wrong. Um, iNaturalist is always, is also really, really great for um, connecting with those people who are experts in the field. Like there are um, some amazing people that are active on iNaturalist that they study this for their, their life, you know? And so it's awesome to be able to be like, that guy that wrote that book over there, I can talk to him. That's really cool. <laughs> and ask questions. Um, so that's all it, it's, I, I naturalist is definitely the, the way to go. Um, I naturalist does have, uh, and sort of AI, um, where it'll see your photo and sort of give you suggestions on what the fungi is. <clears throat> I'm going to just say this as safety. Don't ever rely on that or Google image search for identifying a mushroom to eat. Okay. Never, ever, ever. Um, there are so many lookalikes. There are so many lookalikes on different continents that when you come to one body of land to another, they're completely different and often poisonous, <laughs> deadly versions. So do not ever eat a mushroom that you haven't physically sat with somebody or are a hundred percent positive. That is what you have. Um, uh, that being said, iNaturalist has really helped their, their, um, you know, sort of AI has really helped me get to a, like, get my mushroom to a specific, at least genre, even though if I can't get it to a species, you know, I can get it there. And if I don't know something, but I know where it's um, breaking in the division, I'll just upload things as Asco Mycota or Basidio Mycota. And, and then when I get back, I'll try and key it out and work it out. I'm glad you mentioned that public safety announcement there, because yeah. that's, you know, I, I have to say, like, I, you know, I've studied fungi as a biologist, but I don't feel confident enough in my own identification skills to, to, to feel comfortable with foraging for for wild mushrooms and and eating them i do i do know some people uh that do that including some who i think are are uh are watching this presentation but um you know i think it's it's a really important thing to to just to say that you you want to do that only with somebody who really is is experienced in addition to being confident so yeah thanks for sharing that um but hey you know if you are able to do that with somebody who knows what they're doing uh, what a cool thing to be able to do to know how to go out and get some tasty food out, out from the wild. And don't be afraid to touch any mushroom. You can touch anything. Okay. To, like get out there and get your hands dirty. It, it is uh, it is a treat to feel the different textures of these mushrooms. Some are really slimy. Some are really velvety. Some are really, you know, like squishy. And I don't know, they're just so cool. 
I also just uh, want to quickly uh, just second your kind of endorsement for iNaturalist. I, I use that app myself just personally, as well as in my teaching to help students learn how to identify species in the wild. And it's great. So if you're not familiar with it, it's an app that anybody can use. All you need is, um, you know, smartphone or any type of camera. Um, but if you've got a smartphone, it'll record your, your location. And so you can just quickly upload an image that has both a place and a time stamp on it. And, you know, yeah, as Autumn mentioned, you, you get people that will chime in and help you to identify the thing that you're, you're seeing and help you learn how to identify it. It's such a cool and fun uh, tool. So yeah, absolutely. So um, as a, so like as a citizen scientist though, somebody who wants to sort of take it a, like a step further rather than just uploading a picture, you know, get in there with your with your ruler and measure everything out get a spore print do the microscopy get your reagent see what it's staining and make all those notes in there i mean that that really does add to our our scientific groundwork if we have really good observations with the dna sequences in genbank pairing those together will help mycologists working on those like Dr. Matthew Smith, like all those, you know, people working on these Pisa Azaleas, like they'll be able to confidently see what you have and, and use it in their work. Yeah, I mean, just any information that you add is basically part of this growing database that is accessible to everyone, to, to researchers, to the general public, to all people. So yeah, any, like any and all information that you add to it adds to what the collective we uh, get to know. And, and, right. and learn about yeah. GenBank is also um, free for anybody to use. Right. You can get on there and look at all of the DNA sequences of everything that people have put up there. Um, use a little caution again, you know, a lot of people don't know exactly what they're IDing, but if you see enough things come up under what you've, you're comparing to, um, and, you know, fungi doesn't have like that good base yet of things we can compare to, which is why I'm excited to be here helping with that. <laughs> totally. Oh. Hi. Hi. So uh, first of all, I, you know, I got my, my mushroom frames in the mail recently, so I'm pretty excited about that. And I was excited to be able to accessorize for your talk today, uh, but because it's important. Uh, but, but right now I have a question for uh, both of you. So for Mary as well. So I've been reading a lot of sci-fi uh, sci and a lot of papers by like rocket engineers and they talk a lot about how there's feedback in that field between uh, the artists and the writers who envision the future and then the engineers who try to make it happen and you get these feedbacks between, uh, between art and science and engineering. Do, do you see that happening in your world uh, and, and do you have any fun examples of where that's happening? Um, I, since I've been learning about ecofiction and more about environmental science fiction, I'd say within the past 10 years, at least, um, I've met more authors who are scientists or who, even though they didn't become scientists like Jeff Vandermeer, um, he grew up in a family of scientists, biologists, and, um, I find it's really interesting. Now, some of those people can go too far and say, no, if you're not a scientist, you can't really write. And this fiction about it, that's not true. Anyone can write fiction about it. But um, this will give me a chance to introduce our Discord. It's called Rewilding Our Stories. But the woman who runs it with me uh, is writing her first novel. And she just uh, passed her PhD. And I believe she's a marine biologist. So that's what she's been studying. But she's also a writer. And I just find it really amazing. Like sometimes I think that those people really have, like what you were saying, Autumn, about um, how science gave you an insight to your art and maybe vice versa. Like I think that's becoming more and more true for authors as well. Thanks, Mary. What about you, Autumn? What do you think? Wait, what was the question? The, so uh, do you feel like there's, so, you know, like science inspires art, art inspires science, but are, are there like feedbacks where like, you know, so that 
in 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 rocket engineering, for example, you know, the people who become engineers say, oh, I read about this great uh, kind of rocket when I was a kid, and then I wanted to make it a reality. And so I made it a reality. And then uh, that crazy rocket that they made inspires the next generation of writers who, you know, write the next weird rocket. And so you get these feedbacks and those feedbacks are pretty clear in like science fiction about space. Uh, and you hear, you see the engineers writing about it a lot. Do you, do you feel like there's sort of similar feedbacks where like the scientists get input from the artists and they're like, oh my gosh, we hadn't thought about it that way. And then, yeah, could, could you chat about that? I, I, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I, you know, I know a few scientists and they always are, you know, telling me they're inspired by my artwork, which is great. Um, my husband is an engineer and, um, at Intel and we have some amazing conversations, you know, sometimes. And so, you know, I've gotten him totally interested in fungi. He's, he's got dyslexia, so he can't read all the stuff that I can read, but he sure listens to me. And now he's like regurgitating some of the things I'm always saying. And I'm like, ha, you know, that no, <laughs> it's great. But, um, you know, he, he works with chemical waste and a lot of the same chemicals that he's working with, I work with. And so we talk actually a lot about that crossover. Um, and uh, I think it was um, Sean, it was Scott's friend, Sean, who the first uh, dorks. Yeah, yeah, I remember you were there. Yeah, she was talking about... Um, uh, the, you know, how the cells um, talk, you know, with, with their language and pathology and stuff. I mean, and that was just so inspiring to me to see that, you know, she was reading cells, you know, sort of like I read the spores and, and other things like that. But it, to me, that looks like an amazing piece of art, you know, and I could tell from the way she was talking that it was almost like that for her too, you know? So I, I don't know, I, I, I definitely think there's a feedback loop and I, and I do hope that um, people sort of think outside the box if they just consider them scientists, like get crafty, like do something with it, like make some art with it. I mean, why not? Uh, we all have it, we all have it in us, we can do it. Okay, that actually feeds perfectly into a, a one something I wanted to ask you both, which is, I you know, I, we're talking about these kinds of synergisms between science and art, and I fully believe in that. I think it really is true that knowing some some science can help inspire and inform artists, and I and 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 it really seems to be true that um, having some artistic experience and talent can help in, uh, to inform and, uh, and inspire scientists. I wonder though, as a scientist who doesn't have a whole lot of artistic prowess, what are we missing? Like, do you think that there are some aspects of your craft as artists that um, maybe are, are, are liberating, are, are things that if, if we are viewing the world, the natural world, strictly through a scientific lens like what are we missing like what do you as artists see in the natural world that that maybe we miss if we're if we're strictly kind of looking at the world through a kind of traditional scientific lens does i don't know if that makes sense but i'm, I'm wondering sort of if we can get a little bit of an insight into kind of you know the the way that you see the natural world and if there's something that people who maybe don't have that artistic background and come at it from more of a scientific perspective, if, if there's something that we can gain from your perspective. Um, I, so I, when I am shooting photography, like I showed in that one slide, how, you know, I'm making up an observation for <clears throat> iNaturalist and, and my observations for fungi, like, I'm trying to show the habitat and the cap and the and the stem and you know I'm not trying to show everything about this organism in one photo. But if your if your art brain turns on, you'll start looking at things in more terms of 
so how does this light affect this thing or how does this um color or uh composition so you know that tapanella atritomatosa that i had flipped upside down and took a picture of the gills like that isn't that isn't going to help anybody uh id that mushroom like i mean it's like another like but that isn't an observation right so if you um look at whatever your field of study is instead of saying okay like this is you know this is a slide of this body of cells maybe take your slide and and move it so then all of a sudden you have this amazing like little composition in there right um maybe stain it with some reagent that will just make it like blow up and and you'll just appreciate it for what you've just sort of created there it won't add anything to the scientific knowledge, but you think it's pretty. And so that's kind of cool, you know, um, for, you know, people looking at bugs, like, oh my gosh, bugs are just amazing. Like get up close with those things, like, man, you know, and there's, um, there's some macro, uh, photographers, you know, who are taking like pictures of every like part of it and make meshing them together. Oh my gosh, they're so cool. You know? So I, I agree. I think also that scientists and artists um, have some commonalities like curiosity, imagination. Um, maybe the artist takes some information and looks at it differently. Um, a lot of times there's an aesthetic involved instead of more factual kind of data. But I think it's kind of common with artists, well, I would say at least with authors who write about things that are found in the world for writing scientific observations in a different way, that we might have been scientists. How do we just, like when I was going to college, I didn't know whether I wanted to become a writer. My main interest actually was forestry. I wanted to not go into, you know, pulp paper making, but I wanted to, to go into cons conservation. And um, I ended up just going slightly different because I didn't know if my math would be strong enough to get me through that. It was just a, a weird decision I made, but this, the interests are still there for me. And I think that's just a lot more in common than what people think sometimes. Yeah, and I would add to that, like, we need to sort of redefine our versions of success and failure. I mean, if you fail at something, don't think of it as a failure, think of it as another like learning experience. You know, that's all I've done. I can't tell you how many times I've been wrong and still am. There's probably something in that, you know, slideshow that's wrong, <laughs> but it's just another learning opportunity. So if you're curious about it, like Mary said, do it. I, I have so much respect for both of you because I like, so for example, I would love to get more into taxonomy, but I feel like I'd have to be a much better artist and that scares me. And so I back off and I tried writing fiction once uh, and it was like, I knew it was gonna be hard. It was so much harder than I thought. And like art really requires you, in my opinion, to put a like a vulnerable part of yourself out there that people could judge that is slightly different than science where you can argue like, well, no, the reason the figure looks like this is because the answer is the mean is 0.5. And like, that's more justifiable. Whereas I, anyway, I just have tons of respect for, for people who can do art and put themselves out there. And I love seeing it merge with science and uh, mad respect for both of you and what you do. I, I also just want to add to, to that and say, I, you know, as a professor, I have um, recently had uh, uh, quite a few students who are um, interested in both science and art and sometimes struggle to, to see how there are meaningful connections between them. And so it's really inspiring to hear these examples of how uh, both art and science can be, you know, uh, reciprocally illuminating, right? And, and uh, so I think it's great. And I think you guys are, are inspiring the next generation as well. Yeah, I would say um, along with Mary, like I, I went to school for fashion design 
and got then ended up changing majors and got my major in business and economics with a minor in marketing for my first degree. And then 10 years later, got another degree in graphic design and web design. So like, had I known about, you know, mycology back then, you know, or had the professors say, look, you are smart enough, you can do the math here, we can take your artist brain and help you through this, you know, we can make help you think about math this way. Um, that would have been a, a game changer. So, you know, just as professors, you know, think about those, those kids that are, you know, thinking about things more artistically, maybe they think they can't do it, but encourage them to do it. And even if they fail their first math class, maybe that teacher just wasn't right for them. Maybe go look, there's, there's this other teacher that can explain it to your art brains really well, you know, and go do that. Um, if somebody had told me that in school that I didn't have to get straight A's and I could fail and try again, that would have been, that would have been a life changer. I would have gone into science. I think too, when I went to college, uh, I, I decided on English literature, but then I started taking anthropology classes and ended up getting a double major. But anthropology does kind of have that a worldview that everything like is kind of dependent on one another. Like you want to teach in a holistic way so that you see these interrelationships between things like art and science. So it was clear to me early on. And even now, I think, wow, you know, I'd love to go back to school and maybe do some, learn something new. And I don't think it's ever too late to stop learning. So. Agreed. Well, we need like a dork scholarship, please. I'd like to go back. To <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's honestly, it's like the perfect note to end on because like, that's what inspired us to start this in the first place. Right, Kelly? Yeah. Cool. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's because we both, you know, and, and I think so many of us want to continue learning and, and to be inspired by folks that are doing such interesting work. So, so thank you both, you know, for, for, for joining us today and sharing what you do and what you're, what, what you like to dork out about. This is what we're all about here. Yeah, um, this was a ton of fun. Thank you so much. It was great. It yeah, really was. You. Yeah. Uh, before we do close, I thought, you know, Kelly, we should probably mention our new like Twitter feed and our and our YouTube channel in case folks uh, aren't aware of it. Yeah, so we've, we've started putting the videos up on YouTube. Uh, and if you just search dorks on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Uh, and then we have a Twitter account now where if you don't want to sign up for the uh, emails for the Zoom link, we tweet the Zoom links now. Uh, and that's dorks chat on Twitter. Uh, and so you can get updates. And if you miss an event, you can catch it after the fact. And yeah, so follow us online. Awesome. Well, this was so much fun. And I want to thank uh, Mary Woodbury and Autumn England again, and uh, yeah. hope that uh, everybody's able to join us again for more dorks in the new year. Yeah, you two are awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing your art and your science. Thank you so much, too. Bye. Thank you. Happy Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Bye.